how was the uh, the level of competition? Uh, the level of competition in sparring, particularly because that's what we are we're talking about, <laughs> want to talk about today, uh, was pretty good. I'd say it was pretty good. Uh, how we did it was uh, we did uh, colored belt uh, patterns with color belt uh, patterns. And then they do this thing called a Chonji challenge where they have a color belt. All, anyone who wants to do Chonji, and it's a very rapid fire call the numbers, people come out and could be different ages and different sizes and different rank up uh, up until black belt and then they have a black belt chonji challenge <laughs> and so yeah. i don't know a lot of people did it you know it's probably 30 or so competitors in the bracket in each group you know 30 or so plus maybe 50 in the color belt one i don't know and um they all do chonji over and over and over again and we have to judge you know and pick and we get a champion and they get a trophy so that took a little bit of a time. And then uh, they did exhibition matches in their ring. They have a full size boxing ring. I'm not sure to the actual dimension um, for sure to be confident, but I, I'm, it's, a, it's a standard size boxing ring. Were, were they full contact matches or light contact? Matches? <laughs> well, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a topic that I want to talk to you about. Okay. Uh, because uh, the first match was between Master Nunez's son and this 16-year-old kid from Poteets, who's about 6'5". Yes, uh, and Caleb. Caleb. And, mm -hmm. and that kid, he, I don't, I don't, I, he's an, uh, amazing the amount of power he can take. He takes it and then he just keeps coming like the Energizer Bunny. And he's big and he just takes a hit and uh, him and Baron went at it. I mean, they went at it. Uh, there was a, there was a left hook from Baron in the second round that would have put me on my ass, but he was kind of rolled and eh, okay, he's back. Then he kicked him and he kicked Baron back and he won the match according to, I mean, it was, it was really, there was no real judge. It was one judge, I think from Boutique Burt, you know, looking at it and kind of collecting the points per the, the Waco, uh, Waco categories. And, um, you know, so there's a bit difference, you know, in terms of the head kicks only being worth two. Uh, that's one thing. And you know, we try, we really kind of push a lot of our head kick as a goal because it's such a, it, it can really turn the tide of the match. And so one of my students who's ne who's done some Muay Thai, but never um, been in a ring in a competition and has never been to an ITF competition before uh, is a green belt. And he went and participated in this exhibition match. He was the last match. He went against a student from Master LeGrove Studio his wife was there and uh, the kid that we went against was a little bit smaller, but the first three matches, I mean, my student was watching because they said, uh, I said, Oh, we're going to do light contact. We're just going to do it in the ring. Okay. But it was like, okay, so we'll start off with Caleb and Baron <laughs> rocking. I mean, full on. I mean, it was, it was full contact. I mean, I, I, to, I mean, not to the extent that the, the main goal was to try to knock someone out, but I think that they were going full on. And, um, and then go to the next two matches, which just played off of that. And we're just like, Whoa, you know, they're going, we have to go, you know. So first kid comes running out from Poteets and just gets his partner against the ring and just starts pounding, you know, uh, combination hands just against the against the ring. And uh, that kid was pretty resilient. And he came back. They were both juniors, I believe. And then um, another one came out and then my student went out. And, you know, it was it was pretty heavy contact, uh, I would say, for sure. I mean, certainly not ITF style contact. Um, and that went into colored belt sparring, a regular ITF tournament. So after we had these exhibition matches, which were just everybody watching that ring fight, they split up into a couple of uh, brackets and they put, they had some brackets in the ring and they had some brackets, they had little kids in the ring. You know, they were treating it like an ITF match in the ring, but mm -hmm. uh, some of the fights in the on the open tatami were, I mean, that <laughs> there was not a lot of ex uh, hard, con heavy contact being called. Uh, it was pretty much let's, let's see who can who can withstand. My student just got beat around the ring. I mean, she got hit hard in the head a couple times, knocked down. Um, there was really like the center ref wasn't even there. It was just like save your ass. You can save your ass right now. <laughs> so I'm telling my student to move, go out of bounds. I'm telling her to try to try to stop the onslaught, but against that weight, there was just nothing she could do. I mean, she was just getting pounded. So she survived and then went against a, a gal from Mex a black belt from Mexico. So here's a green belt going against a black belt. 
And um, that was a much better fight for her just because the weight was similar. So, I mean, from that standpoint, it was good. We, I did see a guy from New Mexico, a, a, a guy, a black belt, go against a young black belt. They were lightweights from um, Mexico. So New Mexico and Mexico. And I wish I had that on video because it was a, it was a pretty amazing uh, the amount of, and type of combinations they were able to throw, the speed, um, and they were just nailing each other. So it was two two-minute rounds. It was in the final. Okay. They're going at it. So there were some knockdowns. Get back up. You all right? Go. And they just go right at it again. Okay. So, so, it was it, so technically, it wasn't really ITF rules. Well, I think that's the part of the discussion I'd like to have because yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I, I've looked at the rules and I've been, uh, you know, umpiring at high level. I know we had, you've been to uh, the world championships recently. I've watched some of the video there. There's a lot of energy was been, has been placed on the concussion protocol. Correct. Uh, there's a lot of things going on uh, with Wacko, uh, wherein people are kind of like, hey, you better figure out how to fend for yourself a little bit. So movement around the ring and management of the ring has made leaps and bounds. You know, people understanding where they are in their positioning, people understanding and working with their coaches on how to manage the ring and the spacing of the ring and the timing of where they are during different parts of the fight right. um, is really making massive jumps. So, um, for example, the use of going out of bounds as a clock management tool um and then apparently that became a big problem at this world championships and so they made some arbitrary decisions to modify the rules which were not written and that changed the dynamics again well, let's um, talk specifically just a little bit about that what we saw at the world championship was that the some of the umpires when they would break to give a warning for some some issue if the competitors were milling around and not responding to command and getting back in place they would call time so that the match, you wouldn't lose time. You wouldn't. You weren't able to take advantage of what would be the uh, assumed past condition, which is when you call a warning, you're supposed to, as an umpire, give the warning, make the call, let everybody will know what happened, who got it, and then go. Correct. So you get right yeah. back into action. We try to minimize that time. You make the call, but we're not stopping the clock. And what we saw was more people stopping, more centers stopping the clock. Sure. And... And it was at the beginning, it was people milling around. And as the as the event went on, they started stopping the clock for everything, mm -hmm. which which became a problem. Right. Because we're we as coaches are trying to manage time and our athletes obviously are managing ring. And, you know, if I throw a back kick and I score and then I exit the ring, I can take four or five seconds off, even if I voluntarily go out and come right back in. But if you stop the clock then that immediate i lose that you know yeah. and and so uh those strategies were affected in the last world championships it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic continues um if they're going to modify the rules because nowhere does it say that you can stop the clock and i had this discussion with umpires but it also doesn't say that you can't right and so center that's rep the has the right to, to stop it but it to, in the past the assumption has been for injury, equipment check, um, right. issue with issue with something going on around the ring, the, the jury president wanting to talk to the center. These are all reasons where the center was, okay, time. We would stop time in that two minutes. But otherwise, it's roll. That's right. You know, so, the fight the fight goes. You know, so we have, have a, we have a different dynamic now with this ex we're not able to do some of the strategies that you yeah, so, have been developing yeah. around that. Yeah. Correct. So, you know, so so the athletes and coaches are going to have to if this is going to be a thing and I, you know, and, and obviously this is something that the tournament umpire committee is going to discuss and where we as coaches need to be knowledgeable about this as well. Um, you know, it's where IUCs and things pay off um, is that, uh, you know, we need to we need to modify our game plans and be flexible with, with what we're what we're coaching. And it may even have to change mid match. You know, which right. sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, and that's okay uh, as long as we're all playing uh, with the same rules. Sure. Um, you know, yeah. so so that's, you know, that's the, the ring movement stuff. 
is really good. And also one of the things that I noticed more, and it's been, it's been happening. We've been a very lead leg busy type of um, last several world championships. That's part of the evolution use of that use of that lead leg sidekick and doubling it up. But uh, body position of the fighters is much more side facing as a whole, at least at distance um, versus the half facing uh, traditional stance or kickboxing stance. Mm -hmm. That's, well, you see it, but it's so far uh, less. You know, it's much, much less, and you're much, you're seeing a much more side facing uh, dominant position, and a lot of that comes from fighters that are fighting point fighting, and uh, Waku was a big player in that um, because a lot of the, especially in Europe, they're doing point and they're doing continuous and doing light contact. They're doing all of these different things, all of which. Um, penetrate into ITF sparring, but use of that lead leg, um, there it's not just sidekicks and now it's multi-directional. They're, they're literally using that leg as as baits or direction changes. It's not just question mark kicks. It's not just side piercing. It's now you know uh, sidekick downward kick, right? You know sidekick hook kick, sidekick. You know that the three, four, five, very timing disruptive. So it makes counterattacking a different animal. And, um, you know, like if you're training, we're training our athletes, if there's a linear attack to move laterally, right? Um, or to bait, well, that's not necessarily a good strategy anymore because the second kick right. that they're throwing in that in that uh, consecutive kicking combination that they're throwing was going to affect them. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, see that, the kind of, we always knew this, but, you know, when you see it, the fighter that's uh, your height, but his legs are three or four inches longer than yours, <laughs> just because of the kind of genetical uh, changes. But you notice that that side facing stance, the lead leg piece, that 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 the angles are uh, not not only what you would say traditional angles, but all everything within the circle. You know, I think uh, I remember seeing on TKD coaching um the hacks use of the hacks, hacks. yeah that, that a hook axe kick combo yep. well that's, that's certainly that it comes up you don't know what it's going to do it's going to stick you and it's going to hook it may come over the top it could come down uh, downward by the instep it could hook it's that downward and not only that is that like doing that it's not just going forward they're doing it moving backwards so they're coming up with a hook kicker downward as they as someone comes in and just being tap i'm going to hit you right in the face and there's that three points Correct. You know, so, the, so if you get the disrupted, these, you're, yeah. you're right on, you're going to get tagged again, too. Yeah. You know, and again, the angles of kicking are are changing. Right. So we used to we had we had these linear kicks and we had lateral kicks and we had, you know, angular kicks this way and horizontal. Now things are coming this yeah. way at, di at diagonals from the top. So you're dealing with more Changing, like boom, boom, they'll come down boom. like an angle correct. and then all of a sudden it drives. It'll come down yeah. on the body real hard. So there's like a, there's just a real, um, an amazing variety of action and angle happening with the lead leg is, is, yeah. Uh, and that's, and that's coming from the point fighting world. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've, you know, I, I, I've been spending more and more time around, I have, I have friends in the karate world that are, that specialize in point fighting. And we were just at a, at a tournament and I had some of my fighters fight point fighting because I'm trying to get them that experience. Um, and to watch what these guys are doing, well, guess what? That's what our top guys are doing as well. And, but they're not stopping, right? They're turning it into ITF sparring. Um, so they're finishing with their hands or they're leading with their hands and they're mm. finishing with their feet yeah. and they're just pressuring, pressuring. The use of pressure is really a different thing. So it's a much more active type of sparring. Yeah, um, that was another one I was going to, that I'm glad you brought up is the idea of uh, kind of uh, the pressure. So, so if you watch a match, there's like this, it's almost like a display. You can kind of tell when certain competitors just start to take, take the advantage even if you know if you're really precise and you're watching on video over and over again, you can see that oh, one didn't quite hit or whatever. You, you know, if you're really trying to get super critical, it's it's really fast. And as a judge, things that influence you are just the energy, right? It's it's hard to come up with a better term, but it's the energy yeah, of the dynamic of the fight. And so that so that pressure um, in combination with the hands and feet, especially with the hands, because I I know we've seen maybe four 
six years ago, the blitz coming in and that being used as a tool. Because when you're on your back leg and you are side facing, I want to believe that uh, a slight offline move and a hard set of punches moving forward are still a potential to defeat that. Uh, it's happening with the hands and then the lead leg again, you know, so they're Correct. putting together these pieces in a kind of uh, a really beautiful choreography. You'll see some, these choreographed, not, they're not pre-planned. It's part of the flow of a sparring match, but the ability to kind of manipulate the energy really helps a, a competitor uh, win. Yeah, it completely it's changes right the result. dynamic. Yeah, the dynamic of the fight changes. You're, you, you know, the, the fighter that has really good, they're very astute in how to do that, or they're very well coached in how to do that, um, can make the other fighter extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. They're never comfortable. That's right. Um, always reacting you know, to something as opposed yeah. to being able to, to come up with the thing themselves. Right. They're always just Right, reacting. there's no setting. They're constantly yeah. trying to deal with what's happening, pressure. Right. of what's happening yeah. um, it's you couple, couple all of these things together and now you start to see where are the elite the ones that are winning matches are and they are at a i mean the level of ability to adapt correct to the situation at hand um and and have all those tools i mean the kind of skill set is just it, it's really impressive to me i i i'm i'm blown away by it uh, especially yeah, and, 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 it's, the world championships. That's and it's still going, you know, I mean, like it's, it, it this is going to continue to happen, you know, it's uh, right. so, you know, here in the U S and, and, and this is where like, we need to pay attention, right. We must pay attention. If we want like, success. If we, yes. <laughs> yeah, we cannot continue to do what we've been Cannot. It nope. is no longer working for us. That's right. We, um, you know, and, and so like we, you know, we, we look at, okay, what are these top guys doing? Um, how are they competing? Where are they competing? What are they doing? What are the tools? And it's not, you know, like what you're missing is not the plyometrics, you know, what you're missing is not the, you know, all those things are important and they're part of training, but what they're, you know, what we're missing is the game strategy. You know, what we're missing is the, 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 the physical experience of ring time in a lot of various situations. And the equipment that we're wearing now, you know, and this is something we need to focus on, is so much safer uh -huh. than the stuff that we used to wear. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and go even further before you and I, it was, you know, the Wild West of equipment, right? right. Exactly. We had those foam, gloves. Foam rubber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, you know, it was just like, it was whatever. Um, that ship has sailed. And so we actually have better protection now than we have ever had. Uh, and that should be explored in the fights. You know, like we should be able to do the things that we train to do um, in a martial arts class. You know? Uh, if you look at the glove that's the illegal ITF glove, there's not as much padding on the reverse knife hand. There's not as much padding on the knife hand side. Your foot, your thumb is connected to the pad. You have an open palm, but your fingers are in a lightly clenched position, which you can force through. There's a little bit of a foam inside there that you can grab form mm -hmm. to make a solid fist. You're not supposed to have a taped fist. Wacko, you're taped. Here we're not, but but we are can make a strong fist. We can slightly open our hand. It's hard to get the thumb out of the way for a proper reverse knife hand motion, but you can still hit with it. I, I mean, do it. I do it. Do it too. Yeah. Yeah. So I teach them, but, but guys don't throw it because they don't, they, you know, they got to practice more or whatever, you know, got to find the right opportunities for when these techniques make sense. They're, they they have to be, I think the versatility of hand techniques is an unexplored area, especially when we're dealing with the lead leg versatility. If we start right. thinking about hands and moving forward speed being a little bit of a, way, of a way to counter lead leg, then all of the angles of the hand, whatever. That's whatever. correct. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. You know, it's like we've got we've got things that come from every direction. Right. You know, it's a, absolutely all, all of it. All of it is, oh, yeah. is possibly legal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Watch that shoulder. Um, this one's good. This one's good. OK. <laughs> um, good. Uh, you know, but we've got, you know, I, I agree with you. And I think that likely seeing what we've seen in the past, you know, eight to 10 years, this is going to continue to develop. Assuming 
you know, it was interesting at the Poteets tournament, we had ITF um, headquarters, South Korea. We had an American uh, group from the Yamchi Taekwondo Association, which was Grandmaster okay. Lang's group after he left the USTF. Um, there was there were people from our ITF, and then there were people from Wacko only that came in that hadn't done ITF but tried it. Um, good energy, a uh, good good positive experience for the most part for everybody, and I think that we have to. In the past, there's kind of been this idea that you know you don't you're not well one you're either not the original Taekwondo, <laughs> no longer you know, or you're on the outs because you've done that thing. And, um, oh yeah, other, the other ITF was under che, uh, uh, President Che jung Wa's ITF uh, was also there. So we had, and they're all, a lot of them were friends of mine, all these people, you know, that we have in Texas. So we try to support each other. That I think that's a critical part. One is that we need to be open and we have to support each other regardless of the organization. And then it, then if you see opportunities for your athletes that are really high quality events, you're going to send them there. And that's going to. Yeah. So, yeah. And this is the build. thing, right? It's not the organization. It's the organizer and the athletes. It's not the organization. It's the organizer and the athletes. There are great athletes in all of these groups. And there are great people in all of these groups. If we are not open to utilizing everything that's available to us, we're actually limiting ourselves by being pretentious and saying, well, you're not in my group. Oh my God, it's terrible. It's you're terrible. in a spawn, you start believing your own hype and that's just nothing, that's not gonna lead to anything but um, a negative outcome. That's right, you know, I mean, it's, what, it, it's what's been wonderful about Waco, right? Like, you know, for, for my guys, at least, you know, in my experience, and it's limited experience, but I mean, like, we're training with karate guys. A couple of weeks ago, we did a, you know, we did a, a point and continuous workout with the karate team and they're excellent mm -hmm. and they can do what we do and they're going to be able to help us get better, you know, <laughs> get and, better. That's, and that's all I want for my students <laughs> for sure. to get better, you know, we want that's to my job. Better. Be excited, yeah. be excited about what they're trying to do, get better, feel challenged. Um, yeah. This comes from a different mindset than what we've had here. We have to come from a mindset of openness and inclusion and um, open and mind growth. And, and growth because this is the only way we're going to, we're going to turn things around here. Absolutely. Uh, excellent. Uh, nice talking to you. You too, Master Young. Always good. <laughs>